Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and learn leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness. Explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast. And this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host. I'm especially delighted to have with me today Leslie Libson of Libson Advocacy. So, Leslie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Well, we're delighted to have you on here today, and so I'm going to tell our audience just a little bit about you. So everyone, Leslie has an active national consulting practice where she conducts strategic planning for very specific advocacy and special education issues. She also leads parents and advocacy groupings on topics relating to special education law and advocacy. In her almost 20 years at the Georgia Advocacy Office, also known as GAO, she has provided assistance with the Department of Justice in its investigation of a parallel segregated system in Georgia for educating students with disabilities, has led the Safe Schools Initiative, and that's a multi-agency advocacy effort aimed at ending restraint and seclusion in Georgia public schools, and she has coordinated the Parent Leadership Support Project with approximately 10,000 families. In addition to that, Leslie has also served as a program director at the GAO for the Developmental Disability Advocacy Program, the Psychiatric Disability Advocacy Program, and the Outreach and Training Initiatives. Leslie is co-counsel in a class action lawsuit filed in federal court alleging that the state of Georgia, by denying students with disabilities the opportunity to be educated with their non-disabled peers in neighborhood schools through a system called GNETS, violates the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, as well as the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. She studies social role valorization and teaches and uses these principles to enhance her work of supporting people with disabilities to acquire and maintain valued social roles to access the good things in life. Leslie is frequently asked to present on implementation of advocacy strategies based on IDEA Section 504, supporting non-attorney advocates in their careers, creating and sustaining volunteer projects, social role valorization, and inclusive schooling. Leslie, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Well, thank you. I now think I need to shorten my bio. I love your bio. I think it's fantastic and so dynamic. And, and particularly as a parent of a special needs child, I want to thank you for being such an advocate because this is what's necessary. And, and really, it's greatly, greatly needed. Yes. Well, I started my career long before I was a parent. And then um, God and in his infinite wisdom um, gave me practical experience of being a parent of kids with disabilities. And I live that part of my life also. So it gives me a lot of uh, experience to lend to the work. I love it. I love it. So tell me, in addition to, to what you just mentioned, what propelled you forward to, to being uh, an advocate, really, for such a, an underrepresented population? Well, this is like an issue near and dear to my heart. I actually grew up in my grandfather's juvenile courtroom. 
So my grandfather was a juvenile court judge in Columbus, Georgia. And every time I was spending time in Columbus, um, two different things. They would say, you want to spend the day with your grandfather when I was younger, and I'd go watch his court. And then when I was older, they were like, you're going to end up in juvenile court. So you need to go see, you know, what you don't want to happen because I was kind of a hellion. <laughs> and, and I spent a lot of time watching and hearing and seeing what happened to kids when we turn to systems for the things that most kids need, which really can't be provided by systems, right? Kids need love and shelter and support and opportunities for personal growth and att secure attached relationships and mentoring. And you know, these are not things that we would say, you know, court involved youth would uh, really get from court. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so part of that and, and part of my own experiences of schooling, I, I, really knew that I wanted to be involved in disability civil rights since before I went to law school. And I so sought out those experiences in law schools and I had legal internships in the field of disability civil rights. And I started work at my former employer and, and still massive collaborator, the Georgia Advocacy Office, um, the day after I graduated law school. Wow. So you knew immediately that's the field you were going to be in. I really did. I really did. And it's really, it, and that's been a very, um, very motivating. I think for a lot of, I talk to a lot of law students still who are confused or lawyers or anybody, right? On um, like, what is your own unique mission in life? And what are you, what do you put on this earth to do? Mm -hmm. And I always really felt like this was it. And that feeling hasn't ever really wavered. And I'm grateful for that. Wow, that is a rare but wonderful thing, I think, because not everyone can say that they know exactly what they want to do, particularly for something, honestly, that, that seems like such a huge undertaking, because I can imagine it's easy to get discouraged in this line of work sometimes. It's super easy to be discouraged. And, and to part, like, my bio is hard to write in a short way, mm -hmm. because representing students day after day, year after year, I did that for quite some time, and it, it almost burnt me out. And I learned that I have to kind of switch back and forth my work from like big systemic advocacy, like taking on systems or particular policies, switching that to individual representation, to um, uh, telling stories of kids with disabilities. Um, I've done work on behalf of adults at different parts of my life and my career. And so I, I did kind of learn that I have to, if you were looking at it, you know, almost through a frame that I had to focus on different parts of the system at different times. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of helped me stay through burnout because I think that vicarious trauma, you know, watching people, you know, experience lots of pain and people with disabilities have experienced so much pain, you know, through exclusion or through over medication or through restraint or abuse, you know, th those things are, they're very difficult to witness and to not be distanced from it. And to be emotionally involved, but to also keep your own center in the world. It, it, it's still challenging, but, you know, I've somehow been able to ride the waves. Wow. I, I would imagine that you'd have to have, honestly, a huge compassionate heart to bring you into that line of work and a huge empathetic heart to keep you in that line of work. Because I, I believe vicarious trauma is very real and you can suffer, quite honestly, real physical effects. Of, of even listening to someone else's story. Yeah, and I had to tell you the hardest time for me was when I became a parent. Before I was a parent and I would hear people's stories and I would say, well, just go get an evaluation or just go, go have a meeting or just go for more intensive services or just go find a therapist, like the just, right? Right. You know, go just do this. And I really kind of flung that stuff out there. And, you know, a couple of years into parenthood, probably when my child was around, my oldest was around three and we were in early intervention and I was experiencing all those things as a parent, I just hung my head in shame, you know, just the kind of, it really gave me a different vantage point and the feeling then, I think I was always empathetic to mothers and fathers, although mothers call me more than fathers. Yes, I feel like that's the, the trend that we see mothers, and it's not, you know, for lack of love or anything like that. It's just, I think mothers, we tend to see them just 
taking the mantle um, more so than the fathers. And I think sometimes that has to do with perhaps family dynamics, but also I think um, women are capable and able to deal with this sort of thing, um, just discussion of disabilities a bit more openly than men sometimes. I think a lot of that has to do in part with our culture around what mothering means and what fathering means. Yes. And, and probably some stuff to do with misogyny and sexism on a woman's role in parenting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really kind of push against some of those notions. And I really, when I get involved with families, I really push the families to bring fathers in. Because, you know, unfortunately, even for me, like, actually I got an email the other day from a teacher. My kid was having a really difficult time at school, and she just sent it to me. When I emailed her back, I said, you know, please include my husband in these emails. Absolutely. Oh, and I'm I so think that, that did that. I think that, <laughs> yes. And, you know, and so I think in part the system, I think, is parents' messages really young that, you know, they contact mothers to schedule meetings and not both parents. You know, I think there are pieces of it that are the system and then workplace flexibility. I don't know if you saw recently, they just did a ruling that you can use Family Medical Leave Act to go to school based meetings. I did not see that. I did not see that at all. It just came out like a, the Department of Labor, I think. I think it's the Department of Labor. Um, I would need to check that. And you're not supposed to say that on a podcast, but I would have to check that. Um, <laughs> I think they came out. But, but the federal government came out, that's for sure, and said that people can use Family Medical Leave Act to go to IEP meetings. That's and all over the Internet, there was this hue and cry, how great it is. I was so depressed by it. Tell me why. So depressed by it. Because... If we're thinking about the regulatory system that provides educational opportunities to kids with disabilities, the idea to access it, you have to take unpaid leave uh, for a group of people that yeah. is that is that are often very financially strapped. These kinds of services are massively expensive. Mm -hmm. um, we oftentimes have trouble finding childcare, finding after-school care, finding daycare. There are limited opportunities, unfortunately, for adults with disabilities. You'll find a lot of parents with kids with disabilities who then their children are adults with disabilities doing a lot of caregiving throughout their lifetime. And this oftentimes results in job insecurity, people having trouble keeping jobs, people having trouble, you know, growing in their jobs and getting new opportunities. And the idea now that in order to access any of these things for your kid, you can take unpaid leave. I find that depressing. I might be the only one in America, but. Wow. But you know something, Leslie, you, you shifted my perspective on that because, you know, at first when you're hearing it, I'm thinking this is fantastic. You know, people will have an opportunity to attend these IEP meetings and be fully present and not be worried about work. But then when you mention it that way, it's, it's discriminatory because. Now, yeah. And it's burden. Yes. People act like yeah. having a kid with a disability is burdensome. Right. But I would tell you from what I see, the burden is not having a kid. I mean, having a kid with a disability has its own pieces, right? And parenthood is hard. Yes. Oh, it's so yeah. hard. <laughs> but what a system a <laughs> that requires that to access anything for your kid, not even quality services, but any services. Yes. Um, I think that's really burdensome. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. I'm 
inclined to agree with you 100% on that one. And, and I will tell you this, as a parent of a special needs child, my child has autism. And I am, you know, not to lessen the effects of autism and what it is, but for us, this is just another component of the, the child, um, the whole child, right? Uh, the totality of the child. And so I... I always say when people ask me what's the hard part, what's the hardest part of, of being a, a parent of a child with autism, I always say the honest truth, other people and their low expectations, you know, um, right. because there's so, and, and then access would be the other thing, right? I think about um, that, that we are fortunate that we are empowered with information, right? And that's a time to develop and grow. Um, but I happen to, to work as an interpreter for um, nearly 10 years. And so I was working in IEP meetings. I was interpreting for um, mm -hmm. them and educators and families. And then I was teaching others how to interpret properly for an IEP because that's a very specific high register terminology. And there are dynamics oh, yeah. into consideration, right? And then culture. And then, mm -hmm. you know, um, even from the, the teacher's perspective, there may be an alpha teacher that may be dominating the meeting. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we have to navigate those waters. So mine was not to control the information, but um, control how that information flowed and made sure there was there was equity in that, right, for both sides. And so mm -hmm. from that, I, I had no idea that I would have a child with autism. And so when I did, and we learned more about what autism was, I thought, okay, well, I know about the IEP process, I can just go in there. But then when it's your just, child, the just. yeah, the just shows up, right? I'm guilty as charged, right. because when it's your child, your entire perspective changed, and you're like, that's why that dad was so upset. And and I think again, how fortunate am I, and how fortunate are you, um, that we are fully fluent in English and and bicultural with regard to understanding how how the education system works, as well as the American system, but the American education system and how that functions with regard to special needs kids. And for families that don't have, you know, either if they're not fully fluent in English or if they're unfamiliar with how the, the special education system works here in America, um, it can be, I can't even say it can be frustrating, it can be mind boggling. And now I was able to better understand why I would walk in and see angry parents before I even said anything, you know? Absolutely. So that just, like we're, we're guilty of the just and we're not the only ones, but it, the children change your perspective. And I have to say, I, I always look at my son and think, what a special gift you are to not only me and your dad and, you know, your entire family, but the world, you know, and, and the goal for us is to get people to see our child before they see his disability. And so that's why even when um, I'm speaking to people and they say, um, oh, your son is autistic or they're referring to anyone as autistic, um, I always think the culturally competent thing to do is to see the person uh, before the disability. So of course you acknowledge the disability, but my son, I refer to him as, you know, a boy with autism or a boy living with autism or a boy on the autism spectrum. And so I think the way we choose our words is really, really important. And so, but I will digress <laughs> if, if you let me. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about your work um, because I, I think this is really important to mention, um, and I've been living in Georgia for over a decade, close to 12 years now, and almost 13 actually, and I did not know up until just a few years ago that, that there had been this policy to restrain and separate children with special needs and disabilities. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because your role in trying to um, do away with that is significant. Yes. So, yes, I can tell you about that. That was um, one of the first court, one of the first cases of kids that I ever represented. Um, and this is a long time ago. This is like my first year of work. A mother called me and I'm going to make a long story very short. Mm -hmm. And she said, my child is about is eight years old and he had autism also. Mm -hmm. And he is totally toilet trained. You're totally and the school keeps on calling me and saying that he is having accidents. And I took him to the neurologist. There's nothing going on with his system. He has no issues at home. And I don't know what's going on at school. Mm. She's lovely. I was like, I have no idea either. I was like, and most of my cases I come to, I really think, and this is important, I think, for advocates to come with a sense of curiosity. So what, what's going on here? Yes, indeed. So, so, you know, first, of course, you look to medical. 
And then as I started diving into this particular case, and I, by the way, I've looked for this mother over and over and over again to tell her what an impact she and her son had on me. And oh. they have a very common name and I cannot find them. Um, you know, maybe she'll hear this one day. And we started delving into that. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that he was being put, he was at a school called a GNET school, mm-hmm. um, which is a segregated school system in Georgia for kids with emotional behavior disorders. Mm-hmm. And he was being put in a timeout room every day okay. for behaviors that, um, that violated whatever adult in charge thought. And he learned in that timeout room that if he went to the bathroom, that they would call his mother to bring him a ch- bring a change of clothes. Oh, so he was reaching out for his mother. Yes, and he learned that urinating on himself would get him out of the room. Oh, good. And that was the first time I came in contact with two things. Number one, entirely segregated school system for people for kids with emotional behavior disorders. So if I said we have an entire segregated students for segregated school system in Georgia for kids who are Hispanic, you'd be like, what? Like all sorts of other segregation we we try very much not to accept, even though we all know it happens. Mm-hmm. So it's the first time I became aware of that system. The, the next thing I became aware of is at that point, you could restrain and seclude a kid in school for any reason and any which way you wanted for as long as you wanted and never tell the parents and never have any consequences. It was wholly and totally unregulated. That's insane. And that, by the way, is this is still the current state of practice, I think, in 32 states in America. I need to look that up again. But as of last time I looked, 32 states in America, that is still the policy. And so at that point, I started working against the use of restraint and seclusion in public schools. The data is super clear that restraint and seclusion is the most dangerous practice that happens in public schools. It hurts students. It physically hurts teachers. It's actually, it's dangerous for people, like for students who have asthma to be restrained, um, for any little kid or even bigger kid to be restrained by bigger people and many bigger people, it's just dangerous. Yes. It also is vicarious trauma for teachers. I mean, we could, you know, no teacher went to school and was like, I want to learn how to manhandle kids, right? I, They're not I, into it. That's not why they got into this. Not at all. Uh-uh, not at all. Not at all. They're not happy about it either. And so, but it becomes a de facto compliance protocol for many kids with disabilities. And so I'll fast forward quite some time, but I did a lot of casework on that and a lot of talking about it and making people aware of it. There's a young boy who was 13 years old named Jonathan King. And if we have notes to this podcast, we should definitely put a link into the story of Jonathan King, who died in a, he was 13 years old, had ADHD, was in a GNET segregated program and um, hung himself in a seclusion room in um, North Georgia in, what year was that? maybe 2007 oh my and the, and then a couple, and that was huge. It was front page of CNN, big national issue, the use of, um, you know, the total unregulation of this very dangerous practice. By the way, he had had a dress code violation and they gave him twine to hold his pants up and then put him in a seclusion room and didn't monitor him. And he hung himself with twine. Oh goodness. Jonathan only had, only that Jonathan had ADHD and his parents, by the way, he'd come home and his parents would say, what happened at school today? His parents, by the way, Don and Tina King, the loveliest people. And he would say, I went to timeout. And like, what do you think timeout is, right? We all think timeout's the same thing. You're outside the classroom. You got a dunce cap. You're in the corner, right? What's timeout? Much, yeah. They had no idea who was in a locked seclusion room. That is... So fast forward again, and there were two amazing women who were the co-directors of the Department of Special Education for the state of Georgia, Kim Hartzell and Nancy O'Hara. And they um, convinced the state of Georgia, in part honoring Jonathan King's legacy and really thinking about what's going on, a rule regulating the use of restraint and seclusion in Georgia. So we have a lot of literature about reducing the use of restraint and seclusion. The literature is not from schools or education, the literature is all from psychiatric facilities. Wow. So there are locked inpatient psychiatric facilities that have totally eliminated, never used restraint and seclusion. Now schools all over America use them all the time. So the number one way to stop use of restraint and seclusion is people need to be restrained understandably on the way to the seclusion room. If I knew you were going to take me and lock me in a small room, I would fight you hard. 
Yes, yes indeed. So the first recommendation when you're reducing the use of restraints seclusion is to stop the use of seclusion. So we fought really hard during that time, and I was the leader of a coalition called the State Schools Initiative, where we banded together with lots of different child-serving organizations and educational organizations to, um, to make public comment and to lobby the state and to make clear um, to the State Board of Education. We met with every single State Board of Education member that the use of restraint seclusion is not a safety protocol. It's a dangerous pattern. And in the state of Georgia, currently, the use of seclusion is prohibited by law, by state board of education rule. And they have limits on restraints. In my mind, I'll tell you not enough limits. Mm. But we still have the strongest rule nationally in a corporal punishment state. So in Georgia, you can use corporal punishment on students. But you cannot seclude students. And there are a lot of limitations on the use of restraint. And so that's that's really the best way I can encapsulate that story. Wow, that that took me through an entire journey. But I'm I'm glad though, um, because I think this is uh, one of the things that people need to hear and understand that's going on. Because when I moved here from New York to the state of Georgia, I was shocked that corporal punishment was allowed, and this was before we ever had any kids. So it was it was odd to me that that a person that's not the parent of a child could could actually hold such dominion over a kid, you know? And I thought this this can't end well because, and, and you've seen this on the news for, for children without special needs as well, that, you know, um, a teacher decides, you know, this is what I'm going to do and for whatever reason, and um, then the child ends up hospitalized, um, dead, anything could happen to this child, paralyzed. And I just think to myself that this is just able to happen like this um, is, is unconscionable. But then when we, when we add the, the, the component of being a disabled child, um, potentially a nonverbal child, um, that adds just, it's, it's this whirlwind of, of horribleness waiting to occur. And I don't think anybody benefits from that. So, but I won't take us too off topic because I feel like that's a whole separate episode that we can talk about. Um, but a part of why I wanted you to, to share that was because um, you were talking about um, during the, the 2019 Global Fluency Diversity and Inclusion Summit, um, where we had the pleasure of having you as one of our presenters. I know you were talking about um, inclusion, exclusion, segregation, and integration. So can you tell us the differences between them? Absolutely. And I just want to say one small piece about the use of restraint, seclusion, and corporal punishment mm -hmm. um, that I think your listeners will particularly appreciate mm -hmm. is us honoring its racist legacy and current practice. Mm -hmm. That the data is that that is, is not only applied more often to students with disabilities, but to students with disabilities of color. Yes. They experience it more often, it's harsher for longer, for more years. So I think that the other piece is we have to look at this idea of intersectionality with that, that it's not just that it's happening because of disabilities, but overwhelmingly happening to black boys. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and so I just wanted to make sure that. that we honored that piece because I, we don't, we, I don't think we talk about it enough Mm -hmm. um, and um, and that it's really part of the school to prison pipeline, and um, I think the imaging is, 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 is of, of young um, of, of boys, especially as delinquents and deviants and people in need of of all of this behavioral control, um, you know, which is so wrong. But I just had to make sure we we put that out there. I thank you for doing that. I, I truly do, uh, because I was not only as, as the mother of a young black boy with, with uh, a special need, with a disability, but, but honestly, just from one parent to another. And I was having that conversation with a friend the other day um, about, about someone, but we're particularly, my husband and I, hypersensitive um, to these things. And so I feel like we're hyper vigilant. So anytime, yeah, because I think it's too easy. It's too easy. Um, anytime a child particularly, and, and I found this to be in my experience in talking with other parents, um, particularly young 
children of color, but young black boys and poor white boys. I find that this happens to them. I don't have numbers or stats, but but just anecdotally, um, they too tend to fall prey to this sort of of um, just just kind of um, stigmatization, if you will. And so I yeah. always keep my eye open. And harm. And yeah, harm. Honestly, because it, it is a pipeline. And and as somebody that I I was born here, but I also, you know, went to school in another country when I was very, very, very young. And, you know, those sort of things didn't exist there. And so it's it's really interesting to me that that this is a real tangible thing that exists here. And so anytime um, we receive any notification, which is rare of our son not following instructions, we are so on that. And, and it's it used to be out of fear, but now, but we were fearing that he would be stigmatized or things like that. But now it's more so to protect him and to ensure that his path remains clear and, and in a positive way, you know? And, and I just think okay. your typical parents, think- you know, they don't deal with things like this if they're just no. packed up. They don't have to think about stigmatization and consequences to that effect, you know? Well, I think especially, um, I think giving parents validation that these are real and true worries. Mm -hmm. These are not overreaching worries. These are worries encapsulated in the data, continual over time, Mm -hmm. and and harmful across the nation. You people act like it's the South. The data in the North and and, I mean other places where there are children of color, it is consistent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a a national issue. um, And 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 um, and and good for you and your husband. And and people need to know on the outset, if you want, I'll send you this amazing letter. It's a no restraint letter. You do not have to to restrain my child. Do not restrain my child. People getting ahead of the issue. We've got a good format template of that. And I would suggest that all parents of kids um, that may have, um, that may have the possibility that the school may try to um, enact that kind of behavioral control over students, go ahead proactively and send that letter. Wow. I would love it if you would send us um, that letter and I'll create a link for it um, within this podcast where people will be able to access it. I think that's a fantastic thing. I hate that it's necessary, but I I love that it exists. Yes. And I'll also, if you also have a place to create links, I'll send you a link about the use of restraint in these segregated schools of students of color. AAJC did a great in-depth investigation. It has great data and you can click on your district and see what it looks like. That's fantastic. I can also send you that. Thank okay. You. And now we can move to. Yes. And now we can. Yeah. <laughs> because as I said. Inclusion. 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 Multiple exclusion. in one. <laughs> but yes, go ahead. Inclusion, exclusion, segregation, and integration. What's the difference? Okay. And actually, um, remind me at the end of this quick explanation, we can also talk about how race plays into this because it also has a major indicator um, along racial lines. Oh, okay. um, so. Two terms I want to go ahead and distinguish for us initially is the idea of inclusion as a legal term used in Georgia mm-hmm. or even nas- and nationally and what really inclusion is. So our federal government says if kids are included, do you want me to, by the way, do you want me to talk about kids or all people? Um, you know, let's talk about all people. Let's talk about all people. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's talk about inclusion. What does inclusion look like? So inclusion is the idea that um, your people have social integration and they have a valued role in their community. If you meet adults with disabilities often and you ask what community do you belong to, they would often say, I belong to the Goodwill or the Easter Seals or some sort of day program or place where adults with disabilities might receive services. They wouldn't say that they belong to necessarily their neighborhood or their faith community or other parts of their world. And if you asked you and I, what community do we belong to? We probably say many communities, right? Yes, yes. But it would be communities based upon our geographic location, our interests, our nationality, our family, our faith, right? Yes, indeed. Not where we're a client. And for many adults with disabilities, um, their um, entire world becomes like a service world where they're a patient of this place or they are a day program client of this place or they live in this group home. So that is 
in part what what is about segregation, so deal with a segregated life. Mm -hmm. And for adults with disabilities, we would say they, they were surrounded by people who are paid to be with you. Wow, that is so true. That paints a very clear and, and for us, we're, paid, we're, we're around very few people that are paid to be with us. They sometimes wish they might be, but they weren't, right? right. <laughs> you know, we pay our doctor, we pay our, our hairdresser, we pay the person who does our nails, or we pay, mm -hmm. you know, we pay, you know, you might pay a babysitter. Right. But most of the people in our lives are not there in a paid role. And even if you meet somebody who's paid to be with somebody else, chances are when they leave the job, they leave the relationship. Yes, that's true. That's one way you'd know, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And so for adults with disabilities and people with disabilities, we look at people being included in their community and not in separate parts of their community. So an example of the faith community would be um, places that have um, special needs ministries or special ministries. So most people go to church services on Sunday morning, and they would have a special service for people with disabilities on Wednesday nights at 7. Like that would be an example of 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 not inclusive opportunities. That would be a segregated opportunity where you go to services only with other people like disabilities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so it inhibits your ability to create relationships. It also inhibits your social learning. And even if we're thinking about young people, let's say somebody who is nonverbal. And a lot of kids who are nonverbal or adults who are nonverbal end up in communities and end up in service systems with a lot of other people who are also nonverbal. Well, we know from research, the best way to acquire language and acquire good communication skills is to be around other people that have good communication and good verbal skills. Absolutely. So the other part of it is many people with disabilities who do have social skills deficits continue role modeling and learning maladaptive social skills mm -hmm. because they're in communities of people and around people all the time that also have poor social skills or communication skills or behaviors. You know, my grandmother used to say, you run with dogs, you get... Please, absolutely. Please. Leslie, and so we I, learn from that. I've been peeking into my conversations outside of this podcast because I've been saying this from the time my little one started speaking. And I just think it's it's really important. And, and I'm not sure about you, but for us, um, he currently attends a special needs program in a public school, but he's been in private school with neurotypical kids. We make sure that the the summer camp he goes to is an inclusive uh -huh. summer camp because that, that camp has neurotypical children as well as ADHD, autism, Downs, what have you. And I really love that. And, and a friend once said to me, why are you making it so hard for him? And I said, I am having him learn. And he can also teach kids that are unlike him things about him. So I, I do think it's important for um, children who are experiencing any sort of disability to be with children who are not, because not only do the uh, children with disabilities learn, but the, the children without disabilities learn how to honestly be more empathetic, compassionate, and they, they learn to see friends in all different forms. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.